Walter, that was um, very provoking. Uh, thought provoking and provoking in other ways. I can't hear The specific question I want to ask you is what about a president who tries to set up an imperial presidency, thereby systematically undermining the powers granted to other branches of government? Okay, I, um, uh, the, the, the president who tried to do this uh, lost an election and walked away from Washington. So he, he didn't quite succeed in creating a, um, a, a presidency that was, um, th that was impervious to democratic um, constraint. Um, I, think, I think the effort to um, increase the power of the um, presidency, like any effort that one might imagine to increase the power of the Supreme Court or to increase the power of Congress, should be, if we think it wrong, it should be resisted politically. I don't think, um, I, I, I don't think uh, that a, a judicial process is the right way of dealing with, uh, with efforts of that, of that kind. I can't still go back and forth. I noticed, sorry. I noticed an interesting focus in your speech on um, uh, trying people after they lose an election, but um, a lot of your speech was in the context of the uh, recent American elections and I suppose George Bush. Um, I heard um, discussions regarding uh, trying the political leaders before the election even happened and I'm fairly sure that such discussions would have happened uh, after, after the elections, even if the Republicans had won. Um, what do you say to that? Well, it, it, it was certainly something that political theorists and public intellectuals could argue about, but there was no chance of trying political leaders if the Attorney General was um, on, on their, a member of their party and acting uh, on their behalf. So um, it wasn't an actual issue. The only way you could bring political leaders to trial um, is, by, um, is after they have been politically defeated. Now, for, for personal crimes like Clinton's um, um, lying about his sexual engagements, um, you can try impeachment. And conceivably, had Clinton been impeached, he then would have been brought to trial. But those were not political crimes, although the effort to impeach him was a political, <laughs> was a political effort, since we all knew that these were not impeachable crimes. Um, so it's hard to avoid politics in, in these kinds of cases, and I think it's better to embrace politics and to say, this is the way we change policy. You defeat a political party or a political leader, you, you send him home, and you repudiate his policies, and, you, and you, you, you appoint people who are committed to a different set of policies. And that's the way the democratic process works and, and ought to work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Walzer. Um, I'm not going to talk about the American presidency, so don't worry. I wanted to know, um, since you talk about a minimal conception of the good, um, and you often talk about in your writings grounding political and moral theory and tradition and history, is that if we take that path, does it commit us to a sort of anti-realism? If it does, how do we justify thick conception we have of justice outside our borders, since certainly these trials were concerned foreign leaders? And if it commits us to a form of realism, then what need do we really have to give tradition so much importance if we can flush out real moral facts? So, uh, I think you're asking um, a big meta-ethical question, which I'm not sure I understand, and I'm sure a lot of other people won't understand the significance of, um, of this question. So can you tie it to, a, to an example? Oh, sure. Um, if we take, I suppose, um, the trial of Slobodan Milosevic, for instance, it's 
arguably slightly less controversial than uh, Nuremberg, or slightly less patently obvious of what we thought of what happened. And if we're going to say that there are universal norms, then it seems difficult to have to justify them with tradition, since you mentioned that's how we're going to flush out a substantial view of justice. So what need do we have a tradition in that case? But if we give tradition an important role to define notions of justice and so on and so forth, then it seems that we have an possibility to justify to those outside of our tradition our concepts of justice or good or right, so on and okay. so forth. Um, it, this is an argument that came up most clearly, not at Nuremberg, but in the Japanese in the Tokyo trials after uh, World War II, where um, a group of, um, of, of American jurists and lawyers um, created a, um, a, 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 a trial um, based on uh, natural law. And, and not as at Nuremberg on, um, on um, existing international law augmented by this notion of crimes against humanity, which, did, which had a history, although not, a, a, not a, a very clear cut history. But in Japan, um, there's a very famous dissent by an Indian judge who, who, uh, who simply said that the, um, the natural law arguments of the American lawyers, many of whom were Catholic, uh, simply had meant nothing to the Japanese uh, public who were watching and listening and, suppo and, and supposedly being educated by these trials. And I, I'm inclined to agree that it would have been better to find um, a different way of um, of, of grounding uh, those trials. That we, it would have been better to look for a way that could have readily been naturalized into Japanese political and legal culture. Uh, in the case of Milosevic, um, after all, murder and, and even mass murder are crimes under Serbian law. <laughs> um, so it, it wasn't um, a spectacular innovation. It wasn't an appeal outside of um, Serbian legal and moral consciousness to bring Milosevic on trial. What was crucial in making that trial persuasive was in proving that he had done what we all think he did. Um, because if that could be proven, there were there would not be a lot of people in Serbia prepared publicly to defend what he, what he did. And, they, and if they tried to defend what he did, they would not be talking within the Serbian legal tradition. Yes, Professor Walzer, um, like Professor um, Robinson, uh, I cut my political theory teeth uh, reading much of your work. So. I'm sorry to say that what you've argued today has floored me. Um, I'm a displaced American living in Canada now, half of my life and paying um, some attention to the Bush and Obama regimes. And you undoubtedly know that the impunity for torture has metastasized since September 11th. I think that was part of the reference to the imperial presidency that the arguments in favor of the public justification for torture in the United States has traveled around the world, threatening to undermine the post-World War II regime of Nuremberg and international human rights in a really fundamental way, it seems to me. So what I find curious is that you think about this matter apparently, or in your lecture at least, only thought about it from the point of view of prudence in an electoral democracy. When I would have thought you would have had to take into account human rights, and in particular, I would have thought you would have taken into account human rights given your conception of human rights is based on reiterated empirical universals. If that's what the stuff of human rights is, then the sort of challenge that's posed by the American regimes is really fundamentally important, in which case I would want to make the argument 
that a political trial in these sorts of circumstances is perhaps just as important as it was post-World uh, War II, because now it's a matter of trying to recuperate or reorient the imperial American regime back to uh, some sort of commitment to human rights. So I wonder what you would say in response to that. Okay, well that's the big argument, obviously. Um, first of all, I, I don't, I, I, um, I think if you were to um, look closely at um, America's wars in Korea and Vietnam or any other country's wars anywhere, you would find that torture was not an uncommon practice. Um, the only difference that the Bush, was the Bush administration's effort to, to give it a legal basis. Um, and to acknowledge that they were doing it. Uh, you, you could say there's something um, meritorious about that in a, in a democracy, actually to try to defend this practice which all of us believe is indefensible. Um, so the, so the, the, the real question is, should, should that effort at legalizing torture be repudiated in some legal way rather than just in a political way? Um, and we, we could um, repudiate it in a legal way or a legalistic way by, for example, disbarring the lawyers who wrote the torture memos. Now that, I think, would be a fine thing to do. Um, it doesn't raise the, the issues that I dealt with here. Um, we could also, as we did with Milai and Abu Ghraib, we could go after the actual perpetrators. Um, and that makes us all very uncomfortable because they were doing what they were told to do. And in Milai, you went after the perpetrators and maybe one level up the chain of command, but you didn't go any higher. And Abu Ghraib, I don't think we went much above the actual, the first level. Um, so exactly where to stop, that is, I think, it has to be a prudential question simply because democracies are, are fragile political regimes. And I, I have a very strong sense of their, of their fragility. I, I, I made this argument in front of a group of lawyers, one of whom accused me of defending the political elites because he thought I was willing to sacrifice the, the low-level perpetrators. Well, I don't mean to defend the political elites. I mean to defend all of us against what happens when the competition between political elites gets deadly. May I just make one more comment in response to that? Abdullah Al-Malki, who was one of our Canadian citizens who was tortured in the Middle East at the behest of the Canadian and the American governments for something like eight months, wanted to be here this evening, but he couldn't be because he had to be in Toronto. I wonder if you would feel comfortable making this argument in his presence, that those who are most responsible for fundamental human rights breaches and the breaking of his body should not be put on trial simply in the name of oiling the gears of electoral democracy. No, I'm not oiling the gears, and I would certainly make this argument in the presence of anybody who wanted to listen to it. Um, I'm not oiling the gears. I'm trying, I'm trying to preserve a, a, a regime which is the best regime that we have. That, that we, that we have. And um, I'm not proposing simply to let these guys go. I want to send them home in disgrace. I want to repudiate their policies in the strongest way. I want to replace them by a new set of policies grounded in strong legal and moral arguments. That's, I think, the right way to, to deal with these kinds of issues. I would, have, and I, I would not have put Roosevelt on trial. Look what he did to thousands of Japanese families. I would not have put him on trial, but I would have wanted a, a severe political, you have to imagine an opponent who, 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 who would have defended the Japanese Americans. Who, this wasn't available in the United States in 1944. But 
I would have wanted a political repudiation of that policy. And I would have certainly have said that in front of Japanese Americans. Okay, I'd like to continue, but I'll concede. <laughs> and yes, I, I'd like to put to you that um, you don't, that there's an alternative to simply going after the previous regime when you think they were doing something uh, illegal and immoral. And that is uh, to appeal to an objective international body. And I'm thinking here of Section 20 of uh, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. And I'm thinking any propaganda for war shall be prohibited by law. And uh, I'm thinking that under Bush, of course, nothing of this could ever ha um, be allowed to happen because they, they, they have the power to stop uh, anyone bringing them to international criminal court. But under the Obama, uh, under the Obama administration, he, he w would be able, um, maybe he'd be assassinated if he did, but if he, he would be able to um, change that policy. And it wouldn't then be a case of uh, one group in, um, going too hard on the previous group. It would be a case of where the new leaders would uh, just have to be careful that they paid attention to international and didn't engage in propaganda for an unjust war. And that's where the, for the judges to determine, just to give that, that uh, uh, law some teeth. I wonder what you say to that. And let, let's put it this way, look. If, if I were to have a, a petition that the United States, I am. If, I, if we, you were to be presented with a petition that said, uh, Michael Walzer, would you sign this? And the petition said, we want uh, the, uh, a, a trial under the basis of this section to take place over the Bush administration, people who engage in the deceptions, deception of the American people, in order to go to war in Iraq. Would you sign it? <laughs> it's not for... Why um, not, if not? I would certainly not sign a petition where the charge was this deception, because every political leader <laughs> deceives his, his public. That's the way politicians work to assemble majorities. They have to deceive some part of the majority they assemble. So, um, no. Uh, we have to think very hard about how to strengthen international justice. I'm, I am in favor of trials like the trials at The Hague for uh, criminals in the former Yugoslavia. I'm in favor of the trials going on uh, in Sierra Leone and outside of R Rwanda for um, leaders of the genocide there. Um, but these institutions have to, be, have to be strengthened and we need to create, um, uh, we, we need to create not only the, the fact but also the appearance of impartial justice. Um, now, and then we have some very hard cases. Consider the case of Pinochet. Um, there was a transition from military dictatorship to democracy in Chile. And the transition was peaceful. And the condition of peacefulness was an amnesty for the, the, the military, the leaders of the military regime, many of whom were certainly guilty of torture and murder. Um, but that was the condition of the peaceful transition. And then a Spanish judge with a political agenda uh, wanted to bring Pinochet to trial. Um, and there were a lot of people around the world who thought this was a great idea. And certainly this was a man who deserved to be put on trial. But the Chilean people had made a deal. And that deal had enabled them to, to move peacefully to a genuinely democratic regime. And I would not want an, a judge like that Spanish judge with a political agenda to try to upset that deal. I, don't, I think that um, that would be, again, for prudential reasons, because we hope for future peaceful transitions, which will often hang on amnesty for the tyrants. And when that, when that is the condition of a peaceful transition, I would, I would rank peace over justice. Um, sort of a similar related question. Um, you say you are in favor of these mechanisms of international justice, but an institution like the International Criminal Court does have the potential, because of its wide-ranging jurisdiction, to just 
sort of swoop in and affect the political calculations by trying political leaders. So I'm wondering if you think it's positive to have the ICC as this permanent, wide-reaching institution um, or not? Right. Um, I think the United States should have joined the ICC and should have should be participating in its um, deliberations. But I am very skeptical about an effort to uh, create um, international justice by moving only on the judicial front and not on the legislative and executive fronts. Because then you get situations like what happened recently in the Sudan, where I believe it's the ICC brought indictments against the leader of the Sudan, who then promptly launched reprisals against the people of Darfur. And there was no international agency that was able to protect the people. There was against the reprisals of the president of the Sudan. So I'm, I'm, I, I would look for balanced progress if we are to move towards some international regime of justice, it has to include, you have to be able to protect the people who, are who, who you make vulnerable by your indictments. And, and you, you, have to, you have to be able to, you have to establish some kind of, um, of a, a balance of powers within the international community. But, when I look at a situation like Darfur or Rwanda, it seems clear to me that what is crucially necessary is not judicial powers, but executive powers. Executive action is what's necessary in a place like Darfur, and not, uh, not um, judicial action, which is mostly just uh, talk. Thank you, Professor Walzer. I also have a slightly similar question. I think you maybe have already half answered it, but um, a while back now, uh, George W. Bush was in Montreal on his speaking tour, and a group of people had gathered outside of the, the center where he was speaking to demand um, his arrest and be, be dragged before the ICC. So my question is whether we, as foreigners who uh, have not or did not live under, directly under his presidency, but have arguably been affected by the policies of the Bush administration, whether we have a role in uh, uh, indicting him and bringing him before an international court, um, as he is on American territory, but on Canadian, and, or whether that in itself would also raise the stakes uh, Yes, well, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to give advice to Canadian citizens about how to act politically. If there were a powerful political movement in the United States um, committed to shutting down Guantanamo, ending rendition, repudiation, torture even more clearly than the Obama people have done, if there were a movement of that sort, I would ask you to support it. Um, I am a, an internationalist in my political um, commitments in the sense that I believe we owe support to each other's political struggles. Um, but uh, there isn't a movement of that sort in my country. So um, I'm not sure what you should be doing here. Um, you, you should be seeking justice of some sort for Canadian citizens who were abused by um, the Bush administration, exactly what form that justice should take, I, I really am not sure. So thank you. Oh, are you? Uh, we had to work out a problem of justice here. Um, first, I note that your, your lecture was in part about another sense of trying political leaders, namely political leaders who are trying on our nerves um, what we should do with them. I didn't think you quite addressed the point about Milosevic. Uh, Milosevic was democratically elected in a regime in which he was democratically 
it, 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 and was arrested by a democratic regime. Um, and it sounded in your talk like the only criterion uh, that was relevant was whether it's an ongoing democratic government that can, as you put it, send its leaders home. Yet you seem to endorse sending the Balkan uh, war criminals to trial. So I'm, I'm not quite sure if there's an argument that I'm missing. I would suggest that there is a difference, namely in the gravity of the crimes involved. Unlike uh, some of the people who, who've uh, put questions to you, I don't think that the gravity of the alleged crimes against the Bush administration justify putting those leaders on trial, whereas they do in the case of Milosevic, mass murder, mass rape, and so forth. I just note an irony. Um, the, the, the two things that the Bush administration is accused of that people want to put their leaders on trial for is one, overthrowing a regime which itself was uh, a regime which had perpetrated mass murder, and then those leaders were put on trial in the new regime in, installed in Iraq, which turns out to be, at the moment, the only uh, struggling but functioning democracy in the Arab world. Uh, all of that irrespective of what one thinks about that war. I'm just noting an irony. And the second uh, irony is that the uh, harsh interrogation of uh, um, accused convicts, uh, accused um, arrestees of uh, Al Qaeda were people who belonged to an organization which had just perpetrated a mass crime against American citizens and which uh, has an ideology of killing Jews and crusaders and other infidels everywhere. So I think that um, it's those ironies and the difference in the gravity between the Bush administration's crimes and the Yugoslav, ex-Yugoslav leaders that makes the difference. Okay, I, we probably have a disagreement about harsh interrogation, but um, I, I am inclined to accept your view that the crimes of the Bush administration, which I think were crimes, um, don't reach the level of um, Milosevic's crimes. Um, but I also would call into question the, um, whether Serbia was, by any reasonable definition, a functioning democracy before the overthrow of Milosevic. Uh, many of these uh, formerly communist regimes um, continued continue still, as in Belarus today, um, to, uh, to rule with elections that are not elections in our sense, and um, where there isn't a, um, a, a functioning, lively civil society that can generate uh, genuinely democratic debate. So I, I thought of the decision by the Serbs to turn Milosevic over by the new Serbian government as something like the decision by French revolutionaries to put Louis on, uh, on trial. Thank you very much for your talk, Professor Walter. It was very interesting. Um, if if doc democracy in part hinges on um, the support of its people, and a doc democratic system owes something to its people, and has accountability to its people, then doesn't it owe it something when it systematically strips its citizenry of human rights, such as in the case of Guantanamo Bay? So we saw so many people on very little evidence taken into custody, tortured, take, um, without trial, um, held for inordinate amount of time, and then we, don't hold the political authorities accountable for that. It seems like in, in the best interest of democracy, we would want to ensure that they're held accountable because if a democracy, a democratic 
authority is accountable to its people, when it harms its people, it should be held accountable. We do hold them accountable. They have to, they have to campaign for re-election every two years, every four years. That's, what demo that's the way democracies hold their leaders accountable. I don't think it's, it's I, I have a general argument against substituting judicial procedures for um, elections, for democratic um, politics. I think there is, among many of the people who defend judicial procedures as the way to go, there is an active dislike of politics. Um, after all, in politics, you're always reaching inconclusive decisions. And in trials, you're reaching a verdict, a, a verum dictum of true speech. That's a, a trial ends in, in a definitive way. A democratic political process never ends in a definitive way. But that's the accused terrorists. Um, how should we treat them? And there are, there are two choices in the law today. We can treat them as prisoners of war, and which means benevolent quarantine for the duration. And the duration could be a very long time, but that's what, that's what, that's what prisoners of war are subjected to. They're not released until the end, but they have rights as prisoners of war. Uh, or we can treat them as accused criminals, and give them all the benefits of, of, of what Condorcet described, that he wanted the king to, to, to get all of the benefits of our judicial process. Now, um, it's, it's possible to argue that if we, are to, if we are going to be confronted, oh wait, and then the Bush people have a third option the illegal combatant, which is a, an amazing legal status because it has no rights whatsoever. <laughs> not the rights of a prisoner of war and not the rights of an accused criminal. Um, but there is, there is an argument that can be made that we need now a third status for, um, for, for in, in this struggle against terrorism. And it would have to be a status with rights. And maybe the rights would not be benevolent quarantine for the duration, because the duration might be too long. And maybe the rights would not be um, a full um, legal process, because often the evidence is very hard to collect. And we know people are dangerous, or we think they are dangerous, very dangerous, and we can't, we can't convict them in an American or a Canadian or an English court. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a political argument. What status, should we call them prisoners of war? Should we call them criminals? Should we construct some new status with rights between those two? That's a political argument. It can't be settled by a court. It's got to be settled by citizens talking about it. Um, and, and that it's, it's not, um, if, if you decide to go one way or another, the recourse of the people who disagree can't be to go to court. It's got to be to, to, to continue the argument uh, in, in the political arena. As a quick follow up, what about those who are wronged by their government? Should they be allowed to have legal recourse? Those who are specifically wrong, yes, yes, they should have legal recourse. They can sue the government. Um, uh, at the very least, they, they should get reparations, and there may be other things that they're entitled to. But, but and, and that will in part be a judicial decision. I, I grant that. Um, right now, the US Supreme Court is not allowing civil suits um, and I think that's probably wrong. That civil suits are not like political justice. Civil suits, we, we know how to deal with, with civil suits. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you very much for the lecture. I personally enjoyed it a great deal. I had one question for you. You base a lot of your argument on prudential justifications drawn from democratic theory. 
but I'm wondering, does your argument still apply in the liberal democratic paradigm where there's such an emphasis on taming political power through the rule of law, which implies a judiciary and judges who are going to hold political leaders accountable for when they break domestic and international law? Well, um, we, we do hold political leaders accountable. If they take bribes, we bring them to court. Um, we hold them accountable if, if they pursue their personal interests in a way that violate the law, and we should do that. But the concept of political crimes is, is highly debatable because if you were to bring uh, Vice Pre the former Vice President Cheney to trial in the United States, 50% of the people would think before the trial began that he was obviously guilty, and 50% of the people would think that this was obviously a political trial, motivated by partisan political reasons. Um, and that's not a healthy uh, condition. Um, now, there are, in many criminal trials, there are disagreements about the, um, the way the decision should go because trials get a lot of publicity. But the, the, we allow the court to settle criminal cases, and we allow the court to settle civil cases. But I don't think the court would be able to settle political cases in a way that, that, that held the nation together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Walton, for your lecture. I just have one question. Um, so let's say we have a political leader who's committed abuses after being elected, and there is a group of people that wants to put him or her on trial. Um, what if the democratic process that brought this person to, to, to power had failed? What if it had been proven later on that it had been a fraudulent election, a rigged election, um, and at that point, would it then be appropriate to bring this person to trial? And furthermore, would it be wrong to repeat or risk to repeat another fraudulent election? Well, yes, um, we should avoid fraudulent elections. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about um, the, the Clinton case. You know, there was a, a civil suit against Clinton um, brought by one of the women from Arkansas that he'd been involved with before he became uh, president. And he argued that um, this woman had a perfect right to bring a civil suit, but not against a sitting president. He wanted the suit to be postponed until after he left office, and then it could go forward. That was his, his legal argument. Um, and, I, and that's a hard question, whether you want a, a, a sitting president or prime minister to be, to be harassed by, as, he, as they could well be, by, civil, uh, by a succession, a series of civil suits. Uh, uh, um, often brought by, um, with, the, with the help of political opponents. Um, so there might be an argument for saying you have to wait until after uh, the term of, of office, and then the, the, um, the, uh, the suit goes forward exactly as it would for any, other, for any other citizen. But again, if the issue is something that the country is in the middle of a political debate about, um, I, then I, I don't think a judicial process is the right, I've said this so often now, I don't think it's the right way to go. Okay, I'm just trying to think of different, maybe different ways to uh, um, come at your argument for a, a tempered shield of immunity around holders of high, high office, maybe a way of making that argument that's not so strictly exclusively on prudential grounds. So I wonder what you have to say about this. So it's part of the, we could say it's part of the nature of uh, political leadership in a democratic society, uh, that political leaders find themselves in situations of tragic choice, find themselves in situations so uh, difficult that uh, it's impossible to imagine them coming out of the choice situation without uh, dirty hands. So I'm, I'm wondering if you think that that's maybe an argument that belongs under the auspices of the argument as you've made. I, I think it's one that you'll probably have some sympathy to. Yes. Uh, 
Yes, right. I, I, um, I, I do have sympathy for, for that view. I would, I would think that Abraham Lincoln's decision to suspend habeas corpus was a, was a decision of that sort. Um, uh, there's the, and um, I guess I, I, I agree that, um, that, that when political leaders are forced to make dirty, are forced to get their hands dirty, we, we want them to know that they've gotten their hands dirty. I mean, what we hold most against the Bush administration is that they think they have clean hands. Um, but we want them to know that their hands are dirty. And we want some way of, of some public expression of, um, of that knowledge. Well, let me give an example. It's, um, it's not historical examples are always iffy. But um, in World War II, the British bombed German cities. Uh, not even aiming at military targets, but aiming quite specifically at residential areas. And the, um, the architect of that policy was, uh, was Air Marshal Harris, who became known as Bomber Harris. Um, and um, after the war, um, the, uh, the pilots of Bomber Command, well, the pilots of Fighter Command, the, the fighter pilots that saved England during the Blitz, were honored with a, with a memorial in uh, Westminster Abbey. And the pilots of Bomber Command were not honored um, because there was this sense that this policy was, was morally wrong, even though some people had thought that Nazism could not be defeated in any other way. Um, Bomber Harris, in contrast to all the other generals, was not knighted after the war, and he left England and went to South Africa. Um, so th I, I, thought, I thought that was a, an illustration of how you might, you might um, acknowledge the wrongs that have been done by political or military leaders, um, and maybe even force them with Bomber Harris, it didn't work, force them to acknowledge the wrongs themselves um, without going to the, to the, to the, Judicial to, to the courts. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, a very um, rich and stimulating discussion. Um, as I listen to the discussion, the lecture, the question, I, I sense a disconnection between various theoretical approaches and worldviews. I don't think that we can get an answer to this. On the one hand, we have the, the philosophical approach that starts with individual human rights or utilitarian suffering that says very clearly that this is where you begin. If people have been wronged heinously, mutilated, tortured, and so on, they deserve something done about that and people will not be satisfied with poli a political, if you like, solution to that. On the other hand, I'm also very sympathetic to the more political theory approach that says a healthy democracy must be kept going. Now, there we come into empirical generalizations that are very difficult to sort out because it's true, as you say, that if there is always the danger of people ripping each other apart, that this undermines democracy. However, I get the sense that the reason that so many people feel democracy is breaking down is simply because these kinds of horrifying wrongs are going on and nothing is being done about it. So the reason I don't expect an answer to this, the meta question on all of this, is how we can possibly get the right kind of evidence for what really keeps democracy healthy because many people feel that it's breaking down simply because these kinds of things are going on and the forms of redress that are being offered do not really get at the core of the issue. So how do we sort out the various 
approach is. How could we possibly know what will keep democracy strong and healthy? Well, what keeps democracy strong and healthy is the active engagement of its citizens. Um, and and in, in my country, the problem is not that um, the, the members of the Bush administration are, are, are sitting in their homes, in their retirement homes. That's not the problem. The problem is that uh, having elected a president who promised to end rendition and et cetera, et cetera, um, the country, in, in the people who elected him, uh, sat back and waited for him to do it without providing anything like the kind of, of political support from the base that he needs if he's going to do it. Because um, uh, politics doesn't work from, uh, democratic politics does not work from the top down. It, far better than trials for Cheney would be a political movement committed to ending the policies of the Bush administration in a strong and definitive way. And that political movement just doesn't exist. People, um, people gave their email addresses to the Obama campaign, and, um, and they e even went out and um, distributed election materials and knocked on doors, and then they went home. And they thought, what, what a wonderful day. There's somebody in Washington who's going to do everything we want. But he can't. Um, what made uh, the New Deal possible was the labor movement of the 1930s. What made um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, policy, what made the 60s possible was the civil rights movement. And the United States right now does not have anything like that. And Obama is not will not succeed in the absence of that kind of politics. It's the, the answer has to lie in politics. It does not lie in the courts. The courts are our, our least democratic institution. And this is a major problem. Of, um, think about the fight. The, think about the, the, the fight the, for choice, for the fight for abortion rights. Um, there was a, a political process in the works that was being fought state by state in the United States to legalize abortion. And then there was the court decision, and that just shut down all political action, except on the right. The court decision galvanized an anti-abortion politics. Um, but it, it, it quieted any pro-choice politics. Um, and so you can win in the courts. All you need to win in the courts is a clever lawyer and a good brief. But to win politically, you need a social movement. You need a, you need a mobilization of citizens. And in the, absence of, in the absence of that, the courts can't help us. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, well, I'd like to apologize beforehand that I'm not particularly good at anything, including public speaking. Including? Okay. Uh, I, uh, sorry, I'd like to uh, apologize beforehand. I'm not particularly good at public speaking or anything of the sort, so bear with me. Uh, my question is about, uh, my voice sounds like that. Uh, You should go ahead. Hi, uh, this has been a very interesting evening. Thank you very much for that. Um, you speak a lot about how we demo how we bring our uh, political leaders to justice is through the election process. However, I would just like to know what you suggest for the individuals who um, who suffer as a result of an American from an American president, but who do not have Power to take part in an election. So, for example, the citizen, innocent citizens of Iraq who suffered under President Bush, how did they get justice? 
Well, look, um, as a point was made by a gentleman over here, um, the regime we overthrew in Iraq was responsible for the mass murder of Kurds and Shiites on a scale vastly greater than anything the United States has done in, in Iraq. Um, I was against that war precisely because I thought we were imposing risks on the Iraqi people that we had no right to impose on them. But 60% um, of the country is Shiite and they desperately wanted Saddam Hussein overthrown by anybody who would do it. And 20% of the country is Kurdish and they desperately wanted Saddam Hussein overthrown. Had there been a vote before we went in, uh, we did it so badly that now the vote would go the other way. Had there been a vote before, um, there would have been overwhelming Iraqi support for that war. Well, of course, there couldn't have been a vote given the character of the regime. But um, it, 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 it doesn't make sense for people who said not a word about Saddam's atrocities to condemn um, the American war. You need a, you, you, people who have a record, people who are on record as standing up against Saddam, they can criticize what we did. But the people who marched in, in 2003 against the war, many of those political groupings had been supporters of Saddam. So I, that's, it's, it, that's, not, that's not an argument. We, we owe reparations to the people of Iraq because we did, we, 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 we did so many things wrong after invading their country. But the actual invasion, though I was against it, it wasn't the worst thing we did by far. I apologize for last time. I'll just get the point. I'll take it. Uh, okay. Uh, how would you view a trial that's, that's in any sort of either natural law or legal or uh, any other sort of view on law whatsoever completely ignored and threw out any sort of concept of justice whatsoever? Um, and how does that reflect on the, the government and the entire process itself? Uh, the point I'm referring to is, it, like, as you, I'm, I'm glad you referred to it before, the Tokyo trials. In, uh, there, were, there were units of Japanese scientists in northern China that uh, uh, did some did awful, horrible human experiments on hundreds of thousands of people and killed thousands and thousands of, oh, nearly all of them, with poison gas and in medical experimentation, but after the war, at these trials, um, uh, that they were completely not only dishonorated, they were rewarded for th for these actions by the United States military. Many of them gaining United States citizenship and continuing their work. They they started in in, in the J Japanese imperial government, and there, there it was there was absolutely complete acknowledgement of what they've done by the legal process. And it would be considered illegal under Japanese, uh, Japanese law at the time, the puppet J Chinese government law at the time, and American law. And how would a procedure that completely ignored uh, any sort of concept of, he, of uh, legal uh, education or, or, the, or the similar trials going on in Nuremberg about human rights, how would that, how does that say, speak upon the on the legal system that was employed in both areas simultaneously and by the, the governments who employed it, it would this not stain the entire process? Okay. I don't think you have any problem with public speaking. <laughs> okay. um, I, I, I don't know the details of the trials of, or ap lack of trials of um, Japanese scientists. They were trials. Scientists. They were, they, they um, presented their arguments but, and then they were but I certainly agree that, um, that doctors and scientists who conduct um, medical experiments like those conducted 
in China and in uh, Germany um, have to be punished. Um, and that that is, uh, I, you can invoke natural law, you can invoke human rights, you can invoke international law. Um, uh, you, you need to make more of an effort than we made in Japan to, um, to make the language of the indictments comprehensible to the, to the public in front of which these people are being indicted. But um, I certainly agree that those people should, should not have been released. And I know the United States made deals with German scientists and with Japanese scientists after World War II in preparation for the Cold War, which were not um, good deals. So would you say that ref uh, this reflected any sort of ideological focus of the United States? It was all political expedience, preparation militarily for the Cold War? Sorry, no, no, the, the countries don't have, countries have mixed motives because there are many people acting on behalf, a lot of the, the lawyers in, in, in Tokyo really believed in the integrity of the process that they were creating and in the importance of vindicating a, a natural law um, um, jurisdiction. Um, and they, they worked very hard to do it right. Um, I, I, if you read the dissent of the Indian judge, it becomes pretty clear that they didn't succeed. But, um, but it was, that was, they, were, they were free of any um, expediential um, motivations. Um, I just have to disagree with your statement that no public official um, expects to enter jail after leaving office. I, I feel like it is a part of law and the rule of law to constrain political action. And even though leaders may make decisions, um, political decisions, in the name of the common good, these decisions can and often do lead to political crimes. And these crimes not only violate national law and domestic jurisprudence, but they often violate our supreme commitments under our constitution. And just thinking of international law, I, I want to draw your attention to the Convention Against Torture, which I'm sure you're aware of, that it defines torture as an act committed with, by or with the acquiescence of a public official. And it seems to me that having a Convention Against Torture would be inconsistent if we can't hold these public officials to account. And you state that you want to repudiate leaders in the strongest way. Um, I would argue that the way to do this is through law in order to end the culture of impunity associated with this crime, something which your argument of political accountability will not end because the consequence of which will continue to elect officials who are willing to commit crimes in our name knowing that they won't be held legally responsible. I, I, I really don't, I, why this extraordinary faith in the law? In the United States today, if Cheney were brought to trial and convicted by a court, he would appeal to the Supreme Court where he would, the conviction would be reversed. So we know that because there is a five to four majority of judges whom he appointed or, or who, uh, who have his political views. Um, would that, the courts are also political institutions. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I just don't, I don't understand what, so imagine that process and the end of the, the end is of, of, of a five to four vote, it, it would be more than five to four, it would be, it might even be unanimous vote of the court that this was not um, a justiciable case and that um, Cheney was not, um, was, w w was not guilty. Um, and would that end it for you? Would, would that be the end of the story? Or would you then campaign for a new Supreme Court? If, they, if, they, if the trial fails, I would say that we should at least try because it sends a, a message, especially a political message, that leaders who commit crimes in our names we will try to, uh, we will at least try to. But suppose they are acquitted. But your, your argument is that we should hold them politically accountable by not electing them to the, 
them to office, but when we elect people to office, we don't know that they're going to go out and torture people. So, you're, like, I don't, yours, it's not retrospective, so I don't see how. No, but I'm asking you, suppose we had these trials and, it, and the end result was an acquittal. Would you then say, okay, we've done it, they're innocent? No, you wouldn't. You would, you would then look for a political way of getting, of changing the Supreme Court. No, it would open the door to universal jurisdiction. There won't be universal jurisdiction in the absence of a world state, and we are centuries away from a world state. Right. Why don't you think the American judicial system is capable of having a fair trial? We have it in Canada. I mean, you have it in the United States. We, we have a, a Supreme Court that's been appointed by different governments, but when we send cases before that Supreme Court, we don't expect our judges to, to act uh, politically motivated. We act, expect them to follow the law and give legal reasons for what they do. And the Supreme Court in the United States is perfectly capable of doing that. In fact, they do it all the time. So why do you think in this particular case, fair trial according to the law in the United States with evidence and good judges and, and good lawyers working on behalf of both sides, why don't you think your Supreme Court is capable of making a fair judicial decision? What makes you think that they're incapable of doing that? You have such little respect for your American system. Right. They have, they have failed to do that in every case brought before them for yeah, several years. I, I think it's, it's, the, it's time, unfortunately, um, and we've had a long time with Professor Walter. I'm sorry to those of you who weren't able to ask your questions, but now I'd just very much like everyone to thank Professor Walter for a very interesting